Hello. Today we're going to write a, um, a Java-based implementation of John Conway's Game of Life. Uh, we're going to start with some starter code here, and um, this starter code I'm going to be using in uh, I'm going to be using BlueJ here to write this here. Uh, so let's go ahead and open up BlueJ, and we'll just jump straight on into it. The um, the Game of Life is a mathematical game, and in this game you um, I mean, we're not going to go over all of it right here, but in this game, there's a, a two-dimensional grid that's set up of cells. And those cells, maybe, you know, this is a very small game of life right here. Those uh, cells are filled, filled either with a, uh, a cell, uh, a, a, an organism, a single-celled organism maybe, that's alive. If we see a, a dot there, um, there's a live one there. Or maybe there's nothing there, maybe whatever was living there is dead now. So we have this arrangement of cells here, or maybe a random arrangement at the beginning. And what you do in this game, quote unquote, it's more of a, a mathematical simulation, is you run through and uh, iterate through a series of rules. And so based on the current arrangement of these dots here, based on the current arrangement of the dots surrounding any given cell, we will determine what's going to be happening in the next generation of that cell, of that entire board, in fact. So um, you can read about the rules of John Conway's Game of Life elsewhere on Wikipedia. Uh, we're going to go ahead. We've got some of the rules in here. We're going to go ahead and implement this, as I said, uh, using this starter code. So the starter code uh, is going to include both this board class here. So um, we'll be filling in the pieces here. Again, if you were uh, looking at this as a design activity, it would be interesting to try and figure out how to design a board. We're not going to do that um, today. Likewise, um, the game of life itself is really interesting to think about how you would go about designing that game. In this particular case, we are not designing the game. We have been given the design, and we're going to be implementing that design. Um, we're going to be trying to figure out the Java code that we can use to make this all happens. So lots of information has already been given to us here, supporting material. So we're just going to be using Java to fill that information in and talking a little bit about why we would choose to implement something that way. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this, this video may go a little bit long. So if you're, uh, if you're looking at something, if you're watching something and you're like, yeah, yeah, I know that, feel free to fast forward past that and jump to something that's a little bit more interesting later on. But we will be talking about um, implementation and design throughout. So hopefully, uh, even if you're familiar with, say, a board class, there will be uh, information there that would be useful to you. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, the board class, the board is uh, ostensibly a class that we could use for any two-dimensional grid of objects, a uh, chessboard, a checkerboard, something like that. Um, and so it looks like uh, as I'm looking through it here, we're going to be uh, creating a board that has rows and columns. And then we just have some getters and setters in here. Uh, the get method and the set method just return values or set values on the board. We can also identify the total number of columns and rows in here. Uh, and then we have a two string method that returns a string that we could use to print out uh, whatever the current state of that board is. So as I'm thinking about this, um, uh, it makes sense if I've got rows and columns coming in, some number of uh, rows and columns coming in. It doesn't say this right here, but I think I'm going to implement this as a two-dimensional integer array. And so the instance variable that we're going to use, it'll be an int array, uh, a series of rows, and each row will have a series of columns. So that makes it a two-dimensional array. Um, and let's, since this is uh, board, the board class, we can just call this B, something simple like that, B or board. And that's going to be, um, well, let's tell you what, let's just declare it. Remember, we declare things here. And then later on in the constructor, we actually initialize those items. And here it's giving us a little bit more of a hint here. Uh, we're going to have an empty board initialized to zeros. Now, if I had really good uh, Java docs here, I'd list the parameters for the row and column as I've done down here. And it looks like that was missing in the starter code here. So I think I need to say at param rows, the number of rows in the 2D grid. And at param is going to be calls the number of columns in the 2D grid. Super helpful to have that information there, especially for creating Java documentation later on. So whatever the rows is and whatever the columns is, that's what I'm going to initialize that two-dimensional array to have. And of course, you know the uh, 
format for that may be we're going to create a new int array with this many rows and this many columns. Remember that uh, two-dimensional arrays in Java are row major, and that means we indicate the rows first and then the columns, as opposed to if you were um, just a normal, <laughs> normal person thinking, well, here's my x-axis, which is across the screen, and here's my y-axis, normal Cartesian coordinate system. This is positive x and this is positive y. We typically indicate locations there, x comma y. We indicate the column first and then the vertical row. And that's reversed in Java when we indicate those things. We're gonna indicate the row first, which is gonna run down the screen like this. These are rows starting at zero and going all, down, all the way down to, I guess if we had 10 rows, we'd go down to nine. And then the columns across here, zero all the way to say 19 for a total of 20 columns across. Our two dimensional arrays are gonna be much bigger than that, but that's the, the general idea. So good, that's gonna set up that two dimensional integer array that's gonna keep track of whatever is going on in my two dimensional game of life. We could also though, as I say, use this for other, other uh, applications as well. Uh, the get method just finds out whatever's stored at a specific row and column location. When you're implementing these, if somebody's given you good Java docs, then it makes it really easy to figure out what's going on, to figure out what you should write here. So this is a method. It's called the get method. Am I going to be returning anything? I am. I'm going to be returning uh, an int. So that lets me know right away, public. I'm going to return an int value. The name of this method is get. And then I just need to put in whatever parameters there might be here. And again, if I'm lucky, if they've already designed this for me and all I have to do is implement it, then I've got a row and a column that I need to include as parameters. Um, I'm expecting that those are going to be int values as well. That's a, as opposed to the integers that we're storing in those rows and columns, but they're integers as well. So uh, int row and int column is what's going to be sent in. And then I'm just going to be returning whatever is located in my board at that position. Well, that's very straightforward. This is a, this looks like a relatively easy class that I'm writing here. And I can compile as I, as I go through to see how things are going. And if I was really working on something more complex, I'd probably uh, make a tester or something to test this as I go. We'll almost certainly do that with our game of life when we actually get into coding that game. Uh, well, let's run through the rest of this. The set method sets the specified row column location to the specified value. I'm not returning anything. So public void for not returning anything. Set is the name of the method. And then row, column, and value. And these are all going to be ints. Int row, int column, and int value. So I'm going to be taking that value and assigning it to that specific row column. So I'll say, yeah, the cell at row column is going to be set to that new value. Fantastic. Let's keep on going, see what we've got here. Um, the get rows method returns the number of rows or the height of the grid. Now, I don't have a variable for that. And, and uh, depending on where you are in your development as a programmer, you might be thinking, well, I, I, better, have a, um, I better have a variable name for that height there, but we can actually calculate that height really easily. Again, if we've got this two-dimensional B array set up, the way that works is we've got a item here, another item here, another item here, another item here, we'll say. So in that B array, we've got one, two, three, four items here. And so the way and what those items are gonna be are actually lists of columns. So each of these is gonna be in its own right a column, or sorry, a, a row of columns, another row of columns, another row of columns. Some people call this a list of lists or an array of arrays. And each of these individual I items re represents a row and each of these individual little items in here represents a column. So if we just know the length of this array, this array B here, if we, if, if we know the length of the array, we can use that down here to figure out what's going on. So let's, um, yeah, let's go ahead and, and figure out what that is. I'll go ahead and leave that there while we're, while we're working. Um, get rows, so I'm going to be returning an int value, get rows, and that value is, again, just the length of my basic board array. So I'll return b.length. 
no parentheses. We would use parentheses if it was a string, but for an array, just b.length. And that's really all we need to do for that. Get columns is only slightly more complex. For get columns, what we need to do is remember we need to find out the length of the array that's inside that array. And so you could use any of these because they all have the same length, but let's just use the first one. B0 is going to be the first item on there, and that's going to have a list then of all the columns. So let's do public int, because we're returning an int value, get calls, and we'll return then B0, which is the first row in our array, and the length of that list contained in that first row. A little bit more complex. You have to go in one to get that, but otherwise, pretty straightforward. And finally, the toString method is going to return a string that can be printed to display the grid. So I don't want to actually print it here. I want to return a string that will print it. So I'm going to be sending back public string to string, and, and we are actually overwriting the to string method here. We'll learn about that a little bit later on. I'm going to send back some sort of string representation. So I guess I'll make a, a, a variable called result or something. I'll start that out as nothing. And then by the time I get done with all this, I'm going to be returning that result back to whoever's calling it. And it'll have a representation of this entire board that's set up there. So how do we go about doing that? Well, as with two-dimensional arrays of all sorts, we're going to set up a nested loop to go through every element in all these arrays and uh, print them out or add them to the string. So let's go through. We'll set up a little uh, for int r equal to 0. So this is going to be our row loop. Our outer loop will be the rows there. And we'll keep on going as long as r is less than the length of all these rows here. And I, I suppose I could use uh, b.length. I suppose I could use get rows. That might be fun. I've, I've already written a little method here to get rows and get columns. So how about if I do that? I'll just get the rows and put that in there. That'll be fun. Uh, and then r++. So that's going to be my r loop that runs all the way through. And then I'm going to have a c loop for the columns. And we'll keep on going as long as c is less than the number of columns that are in there. And every time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the characters that I've added in here before, all the, the representations of this array, and uh, add to that the current representation. Now, what is actually there right now at board row column, at B row column, uh, and well, this is a little bit awkward. I've got a string here, and this is an integer value. So that's really not going to work for me um, if, I, uh, if I were to try to do this. If I, if I tried to compile this, it's going to give me a, uh, an error here because it's, I'm trying to, uh, oh, it actually liked it just fine. I wonder if it's going to mess up later on. Oh, that's funny. I wonder why, hmm, I wonder why it's going to do that. Well, let me, actually, let me try and run this. Let's see what happens here. We'll jump in and uh, we'll create a board, a new board with uh, 10 rows and 20 columns. And let's see what happens then when I try to call the two string. Oh, that's interesting. So it is adding all those zeros in there. So it does allow me to. Oh, that's clever. I I'd forgotten that, but that's that's actually a thing. You can um, you can add those straight in there. If you, uh, it will convert that to a string and put it in there just fine. Yeah, uh, you can't do that in Python. Python will complain about that. And if you really wanted to be official about this, you could also say string uh, dot value of, and that would formally evaluate that expression and put that in there. That would also work as well. So we could do it either way. Um, oh, that's funny. I'd forgotten about that. Well, this is wonderful. The only thing it's missing, I suppose, is if we were going to print that out, if I take a look over here, uh, let me run the board one more time. We'll create a new board of uh, 10 columns and 20 rows. And if I try to, uh, so it's board one. If I try to, in my little tester over here, do a system out print line, board one dot two string, 
And you could also just say print line board one. If you try and print that out, it's printing them all out without any rows indicated. So I suppose the other thing I need to do is as I'm adding all these values in here, I need to say, you know, after I get to the end of every column, let me go ahead and add in, I'll say result plus equals, I'll add in a new line character and that's a backslash and, and we'll add that in. Let's compile that and see what that looks like when we run that. And again, I'll make uh, 10 rows, 20 columns. And when we try to print that out, now we're getting our rows and our columns printed out on the screen. So this is a nice representation of our board there. A bunch of zeros in there. We could try testing it a little bit as well, putting a few things in there. What if I said board one dot set uh, one comma three to the value seven? What if I call that and then print it out again? And now hopefully if we take a look at that display, we will see, where did it go? Where did it go? Where did my display go? we would get a chance to see that it had those values in there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that didn't work. Where is my display? Uh, view, test results? No, that's not what I want. Hmm, 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 hmm. Very mysterious. Well, let me take a look in here. Uh, and look at my two string. And you can see I've got some new line characters in there. And I've got that seven that's in there. So that's good. That's that's doing exactly what I want it to. So uh, I'm not sure where my output went. That's a little disconcerting. But uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get that back at some point. Let me go ahead and close that out then. Oh, geez. I just closed the whole thing. And um, yeah, we've got a good start on this. Let me restart my Blue Jay. We've got a good start on this. It's working. The board class is working just about the way I think it should. So that's good. That's really good. Uh, I'm going to try this one more time. Just to satisfy myself. Um, there's that. And let's do, what did I say? Board one dot set uh, zero or one comma three comma seven. And then system out print line board one. And there's that seven in there that got reset there. So good, 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 good. I'm happy with what we've got so far. We're in great shape. Let's work then on the game of life. So the game of life, uh, as I'm going through, what, it, uh, what I would suggest you do is we're just going to uh, implement all of these methods one at a time and talk about how we're implementing them and why we're implementing them that way. Um, as we're going through, if you want to you know, pause the video and stop and try and figure it out yourself, and take a few minutes to look at it, read the Java doc, and then see if you know what you think you should do. That would be awesome. That's, that's how you learn this stuff. You try it first, and then you look back and, and see what you were supposed to do. Uh, there are, may be some things that you're not quite familiar with. Um, in this particular implementation, we've got a main class that's down here at the very bottom, public static void main. Remember that word static. What that means is we're not going to be creating a life class. We're just going to be uh, running a main program within that life class. Or I should say, we are creating a, a life class here, but we're not going to be instantiating it. We're not going to be creating a life object. There could be other implementations of this uh, game that do have a life object, but this particular way that I'm doing it is not that. Uh, so that's what static means. We're not going to have a life object that we're creating. Um, but I am going to have some functions here that I want to include here. And uh, if I want to use functions with that static main, then I'm going to be creating static functions and so or static methods. So you can see that these all refer very explicitly to static methods. That's a reminder that when we write the header for this and implement this, we'll need to make sure that it's static so that it can be used with the static main. Again, static means we don't have a instance of the object that we're creating. So it's acting more as a function here in this main program. You can also have static variables. These are static variables. Static variables are variables that don't belong to the instance of a class. And again, if we've got a class here that we're not instantiating, 
uh, that we're not creating instances of, then we're not going to have the typical variables that you would see. So um, these are static variables that are going to be used throughout. I've got the final designation here, which means we're not going to be able to change those variables. And I'm just using these to kind of keep track of the rows and columns. This is just a useful tool for me uh, to be able to set these values right at the beginning and then use them throughout the program. So knowing how many rows and columns you have, that's just a nice thing to be able to set and then to be able to use throughout. So let's jump in. Uh, I, I'm not going to write the main program yet. I'm going to wait until after we've written most of these functions. Or maybe I'll write a function or two and then go down and start writing the main program and using that kind of as a test environment to figure out what's going on. So, um, well, let's, let's begin right here. The initialize board static method sets up the initial board with a random set of cells. Uh, and the board that I'm going to be sending in, oh, I, I'm sending in a, um, a parameter board, which is an empty board. So, OK. OK, so they're telling me I need to have a static initialized board. Uh, there's, I'm, it doesn't look like I'm returning anything. So I'm going to say void. Um, and then it's called initialize board. And I'm supposed to be sending in as a parameter a board, an object of the board class. So um, I guess I'll just call that board or B. We called it B before. Uh, yeah, I'll call it board B. And uh, I'm supposed to um, initialize this board, set it up with a random set of cells. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, what it means by that is I'm going to go through all the cells and randomly determine whether a cell is alive or not. This is going to be the first generation of my, um, of my population in the game of life. So I've got this board uh, coming in, and I guess I want to go through the entire board and randomly decide if I'm going to set a cell to zero or one. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, board's coming in. Uh, I guess I'll go through the entire board. For int, uh, I'll do my rows first. For int r equals 0, I'll keep on going as long as r is less than. And I could use b.getRows, I suppose, because I have a, uh, a method called getRows. But I have a feeling that that's probably going to give me the same. If I do this correctly, that's going to give me the same value as the rows that I've set up here. So I'm just going to use rows there. I have access to that variable there. I'll just use rows, and I'll keep on going. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll increment every time. Yeah, and then let me go through the columns. C is equal to 0. C is less than calls, C++. Plus plus. And uh, every time, I guess, uh, randomly. OK, so I'm going to get a random number. Um, I'll get a random integer, int rand val. I'm just making this up is equal to, and I'm going to get a math.random. That will get me a random value. I'll multiply it by 3, and then I'll get the integer of that. So that's going to give me a random number from random number 0, 1, or 2, chosen from three values starting at 0. And I think what I'm going to do then is I'll say if Rand val is equal to zero. And that'll be a one in three chance. I'll just put a little note here to myself. One in three chance of having a live cell. So if I get a zero, I'm going to say board set. And I need to set the row and column that I'm currently at to a value of I guess one, if, if, uh, if zero is what's ordinarily in there, if zero represents a dead cell, I'll use uh, one as a live cell. So I'm going to set the given row and column to a value of one. And otherwise, else, I'm not going to do anything. So I'll just leave the else off there. Let me close out my loop there. And I think this will probably do that. I hope that'll do that. If I compile this, it compiles OK. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do what I want it to do, but it's a good start. So um, yeah, that's pretty good. Let me go ahead and begin. Let me jump down here and create the board that I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that in the main program. 
So down here, um, let me create a board. And I guess I can just do that by saying board. I'm going to have access to that board class. And I'm going to call it board. Board, board is going to be equal to a new board. So I'm instantiating this board class right here. Let me call that up here. And when I instantiate that board class, I need to send in the number of rows and columns that I want my board to have. And I already have up at the top here, the rows and columns designated. So I'm going to use those values down here to create my board class, rows and calls. And then I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill that board up by calling initialize board. So I'm just going to say initialize board, and I have to send in the name of the board. So I'll send in B there. And let's uh, compile this and run this. It's compiling OK. That's pretty good. Uh, let me get my window here and uh, run it. Void main. There we go. Boom. I think it ran. I didn't tell it to output anything, and I didn't get any errors, so it's kind of hard to tell. But uh, at least it looks like it's running so far. So, um, well, let's see. Let's, let's, let's call it good for now and see what the next thing is that we have to, we have to write here. Display board, that would be awesome. If I could get a representation of what the board looks like, display board is going to allow me to display the board on the screen. That's beautiful. Okay, well, let's see what we have to do for that. Here's our next method that we're writing. Uh, static display board method displays the board on the screen. A board is a two-dimensional interray, so for the display to include other characters like a dot or a zero, Characters will need to be printed on the screen after checking the int value of that location. Okay, uh, and then we're going to be sending in the, the board that we want to have displayed. So that, I've got enough clues there on how to write my header public because in this class, all of our methods are public. Uh, it's a static method. It's not returning anything. The name of the method is display board. I do need to send in the board that I'm going to be working on at param board, the board to be displayed. And so you should know they say board here. And so I'm, I'm using board officially, but it, we can put whatever we want here. If you want to only use B here, you could, and it would still work as long as that's a, your internal representation. So I need to actually print stuff out on the screen. Now I want to be able to um, go through it. Now I can't just call the the two string method. I can't call the two string method for board because the two string method is going to show me all those integers. So I actually need to set up the loop that's going to check every one of those characters. And I think I do want to use dots and zeros for the dead cell and live cell. If there's a dot there, that's just a tiny little bit of information that lets me know this is mostly space and therefore nothing is there. And then a zero, which takes up more of that space and kind of shows me that there's something there significant. So let me just set up a loop. I'll just set up another one of those loops, uh, another um, row loop. We'll start out at zero and go as long as r is less than rows. We're using that static final variable up there. Uh, r plus plus, classic nested loops for navigating through a, uh, a two-dimensional array. And then we'll go through the columns, c plus plus. And every time I'm going to check and see what's there. So if the board that I'm looking at here, and remember that's a that's not a two-dimensional array itself, that's a class. So I'm calling the get method, and this is getting the number at that location. And if that's equal to zero, which represents nothing is there, then I'm going to print out on the screen system out print line. Or just let's just print because we don't want to uh, we don't want to go down to the next line necessarily. I'm going to print one of those dots. And I'm going to say else if board dot get r comma c is equal to one, then I said I was going to system out print a zero, which is a little bit confusing because it's taking up space. You could put an asterisk there instead if you want, but I'm going to. Use a zero there because it takes up a lot of space on the screen. Now, I suppose I don't really need to check to see if uh, 
if it's a one there, because in this representation, it's either a zero or a one. There might be other variations on this, but I don't need to check that. If it's not a zero in my current system, it's it's got to be a one. So it's one or the other. So I'm going to run through the entire row, putting those in. And then at the end of the row, I'll remember what I need to do. I need to print line. I need to go down to the next line. And um, then I think we'll call that good. And I think that might display the board. I know how I can figure out if that's going to display the board. I can actually call that. So let me do this. Let me try this. I'm going to run a couple of tests here. First of all, I'm just going to create that first board there. And then now that I've written this method, uh, I'm going to call display board and send in that board and see what that looks like. So I'm going to do some testing here. This is, I think, I hope, just going to give me an empty board, right? Because I haven't done anything to it. So I'll call the main on this. And there's my empty board. It, I know there's actually zeros there, but it's displaying them as those little dots here, just kind of identifying each of the locations. That's awesome. How about uh, what happens if I move this down below and only call it after I've initialized the board? Initializing the board is supposed to set up a bunch of random cells on there. So let's compile that and run that and see what happens. Run the main. That's interesting. Okay, so I've got a bunch of dots and zeros, and the zeros represent where there's an actual cell. The dot represents empty space. And presumably, if I run this over and over, I would be able to get a different random representation of cells every time. So um, yeah, so I can start every time I play the game, I'm going to start with a new different random location of cells, a random arrangement of cells. Well, that's kind of cool. Uh, it's nice to be able to write these methods kind of one at a time and then test them as you go in the main here. And then eventually we're going to put all these methods together to actually get the game running. Well, we've done some good work so far. Um, let's see what's next. Oof, this, uh, it looks like this is going to be the hard one here. Calculating the next generation. Uh, the static, and what it says class here, but I think that's a typo. This should be method. The calculate next generation method takes the current board and a new empty board and calculates the next generation for that second board based on the standard rules. Oh, and this is nice. They've got all the rules here. This is good. Um, okay. Well, let's see. This is going to be a little bit tricky. I'm also going to have a count neighbors helper method here, which counts the eight cells around a given cell. So when I'm looking to see how many neighbors there are, I'm going to be able to refer to this count neighbors. That's kind of cool. Okay, well, let me write calculate next generation first. And it's probably not going to work yet because I haven't written count neighbors, but at least we can get the logic down. So let's think about that for a second. So static method calculate next generation, is it going to return anything? No, it's just going to rearrange these cells in these two boards here. So public, static, not returning anything, and it's called calculate next generation. And I do need to send in these two parameters, the current board and next B for the next board, I guess. So I do have one board coming in here, B, and then I have another board called next B. And as I understand this description here, what's, what's happening is we are going to go through every cell in this B, apply these rules, and then set this cell for the next board. OK, uh, well, let me set up a loop. I've got a loop. I need to go through every cell, so I might as well go ahead and do that. I'm getting pretty comfortable with this idea now for int r starting out at 0. We're going to go r less than rows, and yep. And then down here for int c equals 0, c less than columns. I'm so glad I have those static final variables up there. It's very convenient. And then we're going to do a bunch of stuff here and in those nested loops. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do here? Let's see if we can implement these rules real quickly. So this is going to go through every row in my current board. And 
And I'm just going to read these rules out and see if I can figure out what to do. Um, the existing cell dies. So if I've got an existing cell, let me think about this for a second. So if my current board has a cell at RC that's equal to one, that means it's alive. So if an existing cell, a live cell, has fewer than two neighbors, then it's going to die in the next round. So in other words, if I have a live cell and get neighbors, remember I have this helper method I'm about to write down below here. So I count neighbors and count neighbors is fewer than two, is less than two. Oh, and count neighbors, I have to tell it the row and the column and the board that I'm counting on. Ooh, that's a little bit rough. Okay, count neighbors, uh, row, column, and board B. So counting the neighbors around this thing, if that neighbor count is less than two, then I know that in the next round, board next B, this cell is a zero. The cell at RC is a zero. Next B dot set RC to the value zero. So this implements that first rule. An existing cell, that's current row column equal to one, will die next round. It's gonna be set to zero in the next board if there are fewer than two neighbors. It's a little complicated up there the way they've set that up here, but I think this is gonna be a good imp implementation of that. Let's try implementing the second rule. Else, and only one of these rules is gonna apply for any given situation, so I'm not gonna check all of them. I'm gonna do an else. If, it, if that wasn't the case, what's my other option? And what's my other result going to be? So in the second rule here, if I have an existing cell, okay, so that's if b dot get r comma c is equal to one again, and I've got two to three neighbors. Well, I don't have to check to see if I have two neighbors because I already know I wouldn't get down here if I had two neighbors. If I had two neighbors, or I would only get down here if I had at least two neighbors because this took care of the smaller number. So I really just need to check to see if I have less than four neighbors and count neighbors r comma c comma b is less than four. If that's the case, then what's going to happen next time? Uh, oh, the existing cell lives. So in the next board, I'm going to set R and C equal to a one. It's going to live. You may be looking at this already and going, you know, you could be a little bit more efficient on this. One of the things you could do is you could check to see first if we have a live cell here, because I'm checking if it's a live cell and then I'm checking down here if it's a live cell. I'm going to check in the next time to see if it's a live cell. So you could like check to see first if it's a live cell and then check the neighbor count. That would be a little bit more efficient, wouldn't that? It would. We could also, and counting neighbors is kind of a, a, an intensive process here. Down here, I'm counting neighbors, right? I'm counting neighbors and running through and figuring all these things out. Why don't you get the neighbor count first of all? And I'll go ahead and make that change right now. That's a pretty easy thing to do. Int uh, neighbor count is equal to, and I am just going to calculate this once. I'm going to call that function once. Count neighbors RCB. Because rather than having that expensive process every time, I'll just do it once at the beginning here for this cell. And then I'll go in here and say, well, let me check neighbor count. That's a variable that I calculated once. And now I can just refer back to that without having to go through that calculation every time. A little bit more efficient, yeah? Sometimes we um, uh, like to think about these efficiencies as we're going and implement them. Sometimes you don't add them in until later on. So that's just part of the programming process. Sometimes you can anticipate them and you, you go, oh, right away, I'm going to need to count neighbors a bunch. I better set up a variable for that. 
So um, yeah, lots of different ways to write programs. As you know, that's kind of the fun part. What if it's not that situation? What if we, uh, we've got our uh, rule three here that we need to implement here? Else if b dot get r comma c is equal to existing cell. We have an existing cell, so if it's equal to one, and we have greater than three neighbors. Uh, neighbor count is greater than three. Oh yeah, if it's great, because this is going up to three and this is gonna be greater than three, good. So we just want to double check that those don't uh, overlap with each other. If that's the case, then uh, the existing cell is going to die because of overpopulation. We had too many neighbors there. So um, that makes it pretty easy. So the next board is going to have this location set to a zero value because the cell died from overpopulation. Um, I want to double check uh, this is giving us an error here because we haven't implemented count neighbors yet. Um, and then we've got an empty cell. Uh, oh, if we, if we have an empty cell and there are th exactly three neighbors, then we will have a new cell uh, created. We'll calculate the next generation for that second board. Uh, an empty cell becomes alive if there are three neighbors for some strange reason. So um, how do we implement that? Else, if our current cell is dead, nothing there, and the neighbor count is equal to three, is exactly equal to three, then our next board is going to set, uh, we're going to have this location come alive because the conditions are right. I'm gonna do one more thing. Those are our rules. And I'm gonna do one more thing in our board here because I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna end up copying as I'm going through, I'm, I'm thinking about moving cells back and forth. And what happens in the next generation is if I haven't set the next RC to one of these values using one of these rules, then I am, just to be safe, I'm gonna set that next board location to a zero. And that's actually gonna be an advantage, I think, to me a little bit later on. So uh, again, these are the rules for what happens if we do have a live cell or we have a dead cell that's about to become alive. And this is gonna be the rule for if we don't have any other rules. If there's nothing else going on for that cell, then I'm gonna make sure that that next board has a zero set there. And I said that this is going to be a new empty board, but I think I may be able to save myself a little trouble if I just use the same board over and over and just make sure as I'm going through that I set things to zero, um, effectively cleaning it out as we go. Well, I can compile that, but it's not going to compile because, again, I don't have this count neighbor set up. So let's dig into this. And this may be, for us, kind of the hardest part of this static method, uh, of the static methods we're gonna be writing. So let's figure out what's happening here. And uh, then I think we'll be pretty close. So the static method count neighbors, oh, and it has a return value. Yeah, I'm gonna return the number of non-zero neighbors. There will be zero as a minimum and eight as a maximum if I'm completely surrounded. So let's see how this goes. Um, so this is going to be a public static. I'm returning an int value, which is the number of neighbors. And the, the method is called count neighbors. And I need to send in some parameters, as we know. I need to send in the row that I'm currently checking, the column that I'm currently checking, and the board that I'm checking. So we're going to get all that information in there. And Here's what I need to do. So I've got some board. Let's, let's take a look at what this looks like. I've got some massive board set up here. Sorry for my terrible drawing there. That, that was really, truly awful here. Let's do that. And uh, so this is gonna be set up in rows and columns, as you know, and some of these have cells and that are alive and some are dead. And so let's take a look at this first cell right here. And maybe that cell's alive and this one's dead, and this one's dead, but this one's alive. And so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be counting, I'm gonna go through the entire thing, every row and every column, and I'm gonna be counting all the cells. And think about this for a second. If I'm looking at this cell right here, I don't know if you can see that yellow color, I'm going to be counting 
the eight potential cells around that cell. So what that means is I'm going to have kind of the a three by three matrix of cells around there. And I'm going to check here and 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 here. And if I have any ones in any of those, I'm going to increment my counter and that'll tell me at the end, by the time I get done, I'm going to know that I had, well, no cells here, no cells here and one cell here. So I'd have a result of one. I have one neighbor showing, one immediate neighbor in that range around there. Well, it's a little bit tricky because I'd like to set up a loop that basically is going to go, I guess if my row is zero, I want to go from minus one to plus one there. And same thing, if my column is whatever value, I want to go C minus one to C plus one. But I got to be careful that I don't go outside the bounds of my of my board, right? I, if I try and check out here, I'm going to get a, a bounds error. It's going to mess up. So I'll have to double check that. And I'm also going to have to make sure if I set up loops to do this, that I don't actually count the middle here. I don't want to count that person because that's that's not a neighbor. That's me. So if I was just blindly counting up all nine cells, I'd get a, a neighbor count of two. And that's wrong. I only have one neighbor here. So let's think about how we're going to try and make that happen. That's, a, that's going to be interesting. So, uh, well, let me set up my loops, first of all. Uh, let me set up my counter. First of all, I'll set up my counter that's going to um, figure all these things out. So I'll set that up as a counter with zero. And let me just set up the loop that's going to run through. My rows need to go from whatever my current row is, which is row. So I'm going to say R is going to start out at row minus one. It's going to be the initial value. I'll, R is my counting variable. And we'll start out at row minus one. And I'm going to keep on going as long as I'm less than row plus one. Oh, but wait, remember that we stop right before we get to row plus one. And I want to include row plus one. So I either need to say, go all the way to row plus two, which will stop, which will include row plus one, but stop there. Or I need to say less than or equal to row plus one. Lots of room for an off by one error here. So we need to be really careful. And then I'll say R plus plus. And then I need to set up my nested loop that's going to look at the columns and do the same thing. So for C equal to column minus one, C, I'll keep it going as long as I'm less than or equal to column plus one, and then C plus plus. So this will be my nested loop that's going to run through all these cells in the vicinity of the cell I'm looking at. I'm currently evaluating. And I guess I've got a series of conditions because, again, I need to be really careful here. So if I guess my row value is greater than or equal to zero, I, I do have to have a legal row value there. My row has to be greater than or equal to zero if I'm going to be able to access this cell and figure out something about it. And I guess it's also the case that my row has to be a legal row. So it has to be less than rows. In other words, when I start checking down here, I want to make sure that I don't go beyond the number of rows I have. And so I'll check that there. So that's one of the checks I need to make. I also need to do the same checks with the columns. And so I'm going to uh, do another and and space this down because it's very symmetric. It's very similar. So I can check to see my patterns are good if I uh, see it down here, if I, if I match up. So C also needs to be greater than or equal to zero. And C has to be less than columns. So these two Boolean expressions are going to make sure that I have a legal cell on the board that I can reference before I try to reference it. If it isn't, then I'm not going to bother. Uh, I also have a couple of other things I need to check. I, I have to make sure that I'm not checking this cell here where C is equal to uh, column and R is equal to row. So I also have to check that it's not the case that C is equal to, I'll do rows first, R is equal to row 
and C is equal to column. Now, what I did there is I said, well, R is equal, if R is equal to row and C is equal to column, then that means I'm at this location. I only want to do this if I'm not at that location. So if I have a legal row and if I have a legal column and I'm not currently in the middle, which is where I am, and there's one more thing, and if the cell I'm looking at is live, if b.getRC is equal to one, if the board that I'm at at this location has a cell, if it's currently living, if all of those are true, then that means I'm going to be able to add one to my counter. If that's all true, then count plus plus. That's a little bit rough there. For a lot of people, that's kind of that's kind of the challenging part in all of this is just making sure that we get that count plus plus taken care of. If it's not a live cell, then I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, and you can see, oh, I forgot my ints here, right? Int and int for my counter variables. And uh, wow, that's that's pretty cool. But let's see, let's see if that's working for us. I'm going to go up here and get rid of that. And let's see if this count neighbors is working the way we think it should. Um, looks like I've got uh, maybe, oh, because I'm supposed to return count. Thank you, compiler, or um, IDE, rather. Let me get in here. And at the very end, after I've done all those, I'm going to return the value of count. Cool. So let's do this. I'm going to initialize the board. I'm going to display the board. And then I am going to system out print line um, count neighbors for the position 0, 0, and the board, board. Just want to try this out and see what happens, see if I'm getting the right result there. So I'm going to compile that, and it doesn't like it. Uh, sorry, is it uh, count neighbors? Yeah. Zero, zero, what did I do wrong? Board, uh, oh, I need an extra parenthesis. There we go. Let's try running this and see what happens. Oh my goodness. So we're calling our main. We're gonna get this random board and I'm looking up here at this particular location, that's zero, zero. And how many neighbors do we have around there? You can see that I should have. Well, one, one thing I know right now is I'm really happy that I didn't get a bounds error because you'll know right away if you get a bounds error, it'll blow up because this is out of bounds, 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 this is out of bounds. I was checking for all the neighbors around this guy and there's two of them. And look what showed up down here, two. So I think my neighbor count is working well. Let me, uh, I'm gonna try one more time. I'm gonna run that one more time and see if we can get the same thing to happen, see if we get the result. It's not a perfect check, but, oh, it looks like I have no neighbors up there and it's got zero down here now. Let's try another one, just for fun. Uh, also no neighbors. Uh, I was hoping to get some neighbors so we could check and see if the neighbor counting is working. Still, oh wait, oh, this is a problem. It looks to me as if, shouldn't I have, uh, yeah, uh, oh wait. Oh no, sorry, yeah, so it wasn't far far down enough. I thought maybe it was missing. Huh, let me get one more. I'm, I'm good so far. I've got one neighbor there, it's counting the one neighbor. Okay, well maybe this is good. Maybe this is good. So here's what I wanna do then. Uh, if, that's, if that's working okay, let's do one more thing. The static method transfer next to current takes the board with the next generation and copies it to the board for this generation so that we can continue displaying and analyzing generations. So I take the next board and transfer it to this board. That actually sounds like that might be super easy to do. Uh, public, static, no return value, transfer next to current. And I have to send in one board called board and then I have to send in another board called next board. And I'm just going to go through 
and copy over next board to this board. Okay, so for, I guess, int r equal to zero, r less than rows, this is starting to become very familiar. For int c equal to zero, c less than columns, c plus plus. And I need to take my current board, board dot set row column to a new value. And what's that value going to be? It's the value that's already been established in the next board. So I guess I'm going to have to say next board get the value that's located at r comma c. I'll get that value. That's a value. That's a, a result. And then I'll store it in this one. And then uh, it looks like I'm going to be missing a parenthesis there again. And then uh, I think that'll work. I think that might work just fine. That'll transfer those over. Well, we'll see. We'll get a chance to see in just a moment. We'll see what happens here. Uh, clear console is a method that probably won't work in BlueJay, but this uh, non-printing character will try to flush the screen and uh, move it up so that we can see frame by frame what's happening. And this uh, slow method here, I just included this in here. So if we specify a number of milliseconds, we can um, slow down the development or the display of our game of life so we can see what's going on. All right, well, I think things are pretty good here. So let me just think about what I'm gonna do down here. I think what I'll do is, uh, how about if I do this? I'm going to create the board. I'm going to initialize the board. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run through, say, 100 generations, all right? I less than 100. And I'm just gonna set up a big loop that's gonna run through and do all these things kind of in order each time. So first thing I think I'll do is I'll display the board. And how do I display the board? I think I have a function or a method for that, static method for that. Display board, and I send in the board. That's kind of cool. Okay, display board. I'll send in the board. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the next, oh, how about if I pause it from, for a moment? Actually, before I display the board, let me clear the console. I'll try to clear the console. Okay, it's all coming together. Clear console, call that method. Display the board, sure. Let's delay for a moment. Now I set up a time delay here at the top of 500. That's 500 milliseconds or half a second. So um, yeah, let's use that. We'll go ahead and use that. I'll just call, uh, time or slow here with the time delay. And um, oh, I have to specify the time delay, but I've got a time delay right there. So yeah, I'll just call slow with time delay. Slow with time delay, of that static variable. So that's gonna like pause things just for a moment. Then I'm going to get the next generation. Is it get next or create next? Calculate next generation. Calculate next generation. And what do I need to do? I need to send in a couple of boards there. Oh, and I've only got one board right now, and I need to I need to send in a next board that I haven't created yet. So how about if I do that up here? I'm going to create a second board up at the top here. I hadn't thought to do that, but we'll send up it set up another board, a second board, and we'll be using that kind of as our scratch paper as we calculate our new next generation each time. I don't need to initialize that next board because it's just a blank board to begin with. But what I'll do here then is um, I'll calculate the next generation and take whatever I'm looking at now and copy it onto that next board. And then I suppose after I calculate that next generation, what I need to do then, because this just calculates it and puts it on there, then I've got this transfer next to current. So that's why I designed that transfer next to current. When I was thinking about making this game, I was thinking, well, I have to not only calculate the next board, but I have to transfer it back into this original board there. 
And at that point, I think I can just continue, right? I think I can just go on and come back up here and clear the console, display the board. This is now the next board that I've transferred over. Wait for a moment, get the next generation. I think this will probably go through that process. It may not, we'll have to see. You, I, I gotta tell you, I've written games of life before and it's not always neat and pretty like I'm doing it right now. Uh, there can be a lot of things that go wrong, but let's try this out and see what happens. So this is cool. This is interesting. So um, you can see this H2J. First of all, yes, I have little cells that are living and dying and little patterns that are maybe evolving. This H2J is what happens when we're trying to print out that flushing the screen and Blue J isn't really sure what to do with that. Um, but as I'm looking at this, I can tell you that we've implemented those rules correctly here. This little pattern here is called a blinker, the up and down there, that's a blinker back and forth. Um, that's a pattern that typically uh, arrives in a game of life. This is called a hexagon right here, for obvious reasons, it kind of looks a little, little bit like a hexagon. This is a hexagon as well, it's a stable shape. Here's four in a row, that makes a stable shape. So these are all classic stable shapes that run in a game of life. So we've done this correctly. I want to run it maybe a couple more times. Maybe I'll go 200 times. And maybe I'm going to set my, um, set my delay to a little bit smaller. Let me save that there. And let me see if I can uh, run this again. We'll run this again, see what happens. See if we can get a, uh, an interesting game of life going on here. So it's cool. We're seeing things evolving. We're seeing things change over time. If you have your window sized the wrong way, then they kind of flip by like this, and it's a little bit hard to see what happens because you have half the screen showing. Um, but if you ran this in the terminal, it'll look a little bit better. And ultimately, what you want to do is maybe get a really big game of life, like as big as your entire screen. That would be awesome if you could set that up and get that running. All right. Well, this has been very fun. I think uh, I think this is a decent implementation of the game of life, and hopefully. Uh, you can use it to get your own game of life working. Thanks for watching.